and welcome to today's Novage webinar, Quick Start to Vectorworks Architect 2022, Creating the Project. In this webinar, Jonathan Pickup will use a small building, less than 100 square feet, let's say, to showcase the basic principle of Vectorworks Architect. It will start with layers and classes to teach you um, to structure the file for drawings and design. And further on, it will create walls, floors, floor structure, roof, and roof structure. And as I mentioned, today's webinar presenter is Jonathan Pickup, who is trained as an architect in New Zealand and in the UK. And he has more than 30 years of experience. He has been writing and producing Vectorworks manuals and providing customer support for more than 20 years. His company, Archon CAD, is the premier provider of third-party manuals and training resources for Vectorworks. He offers monthly webinars and maintains the visual knowledge base for Vectorworks. And now let me tell you a little bit about Novedge. Novage is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, faster service, and with zero headache. Check us out at Novage.com. Now, Jonathan, as promised, I'm going to make you the star of the show, as you are, and give you full mm -hmm. and center stage. Cool. Thank you very much, Barbara. I always I always cringe a little bit when you introduce me as the, you know. But I, one thing I didn't mention, Barbara, this year is the 30th anniversary of my first copy of Vectorworks. Wow. So, Congrats. So that's something. All right. What a, so, what a landmark. Isn't it? So this is the little building we're going to look at. So I'll just spin around and, and have a look at it. So it's like a little building. It's got little little bits and pieces. Now you might be looking at this building and think, how can we possibly learn enough to make it worthwhile? But a lot of the techniques I'm going to use, we're going to use exactly on a bigger building. So the way I'm going to create the roof, the way I'm going to create the roof framing, the floor framing, the walls and doors and windows, we will use those on much larger buildings. But the smaller building helps people to focus on what we're covering. And it helps people to, to uh, stay attuned to this kind of thing. So let's have a look at this. Uh, we're going to start with a brand new blank file. Now, the reason I want to use a blank file is that my template file has a lot of little bits and pieces in it that really speed me up. But I want to start right from the beginning with a blank file so that I can uh, make sure that we cover everything. Now, I've just lost all my notes. There we are. There's all my notes again. Okay, so we're going to start with a blank file. We've got the new... We're going to talk about layers. We're going to use design layers, that's these ones here, to structure my file. We can use design layers. We can also use stories, but I'm not going to cover stories today. Uh, we're going to focus mainly on a really simple building, but I will use a story, and I'm going to edit this. So let's just go into here. We'll just click on this area here, and we're going to edit the story. I want to change its name. I can just click on it. This is going to be my walls. I need a new story above, which is going to be my roof. So let's create a new story. We're going to put one called a roof. And we have the ability, sorry about that, let's just bring that back. So we have the ability to set elevation of our stories or of our layers. So we can set the elevation of our walls. We can set the elevation of the roof. And we can also set the layer wall height, which I'm just going to leave as it is at the moment. But we do have the ability to control the height of our walls by putting in a, a height for that. I think at the moment I'm using a metric file. In a minute, I'll change to an imperial file uh, just to make it a little bit more useful because most people here are probably imperial or at least both. So that's the start, just using layers. And this allows me to put all my roof information on one layer and all my wall information on the other. So let's get started again. We're going to set an active layer scale, right click. I quite often do it this way, the quick way, active layer scale. Although if I've got two layers, it's probably easier to select them both. Then let's edit those. Now it's a really small building, so I'm going to make them both 1 to 25 scale, which is more of an engineering scale. I could use one of these ones over here, um, but I only, I'm sorry, I think in the engineering scales. So there we are, 1 to 25, and now let's do our page setup. File, page setup. I'm going to set mine to an A3 page size, which is about 11 by 16, I think. Let's just do that one. And it's going to be a landscape page. And now I can fit to page. Now, there's a, I just used a keyboard shortcut that I use quite often, but there's a button here for doing that. 
fit to page area, so now I can see my entire design. Let's do our units, shall we? So let's go, um, first of all, I'm gonna create a rectangle, and this is going to be a rectangle, which is going to be about uh, 4.8 meters by 2.4. So uh, 4.2 meters is what I really need in that direction. So I can type 4.2, hit the tab key, and I can type minus 2.4 in that direction, meters. Make sure you put the M, otherwise it doesn't recognize as meters. Enter once, enter again, and it creates my object. Now this is about uh, 10 square meters or just about 100 square feet. So it's, it's quite a small building. But as I say, this is a quick start. We're gonna go through some quick things just to make it really quick. Um, and so we're not gonna cover a whole lot of some of the detail, but I wanna go back to my units. So file on the menu bar and we'll choose document settings and we'll choose units. Now at the moment, my dual dimensions are feet and inches and my main dimensions are millimeters. Now I've got some here that I've saved previously. So I've got some here, if I just click on meters, it'll actually restore units that I've saved previously, which has got my dual dimensions in meters and my primary dimensions in millimeters. But we're gonna use feet and inches, so we'll set that. What's the difference between dimensions and dual dimensions? It allows me to have two different dimension styles or uh, dimension standards some doing feet and inches and some doing just feet, which is really handy when you're doing site plans. So we're gonna work in feet and inches today. So I'm going to start with a rectangle and you can double click on the rectangle torch, which is a really quick way to create a rectangle. So I want this to be eight feet by four feet. Uh, actually eight, eight by four is too small. So I'm gonna make it 16 feet in that direction. And just make sure I get the 16 feet and eight feet in that direction. Is that right? 2.4. Now I'm confused with my metric. I'm not that good at it. So that's 4.2 meters. And I can still, even though I'm using metric dimensions, I can still go 4.2 meters in that direction. And I can go 2.4 meters in that direction. So it was 13 feet by seven. That's what I really want, should have been putting in. We're going to make this at zero, zero. By setting this the center of my rectangle at zero, zero, my rectangle will turn up in the middle of the screen. I'll be able to work right in the middle of my page. And that should work really well for me. So I'm just going to hold down the mouse wheel button. So I, I use a whole lot of keyboard shortcuts. So one of the ones I use is the middle mouse wheel button. If you hold down the middle mouse wheel button, you can pan the view. If you hold the control key down as well, we can tip the view or we can use the flyover. You can see I can fly over it. And I've made a rectangle, but it's a planar object, which means it looks like it's three dimensional. I'm going to create this into a slab. So I'm gonna right click. I love this command here. It's called create objects from shapes. When I use that, I can create all kinds of different things. I can create walls and slabs and spaces and site modifiers. What do I want today? I want a slab. So we're going to create a slab. I'm going to delete my little rectangle. If you forget to delete your rectangle, when you start working on the slab and you turn the slab off, your rectangle will still be there. So it's a good idea to make sure you turn that off. Cool. So now I have a slab object. There we are. Now, it's not really a, a, the slab object that I want, so I'm going to edit this, and I'm going to go through the settings. But before we do that, just a couple of keyboard shortcuts. I use the numeric keypad a lot. And if you've got a Mac, uh, Macintosh with the, without the, the numeric keypad or a laptop, I've seen lots of Windows laptops without a numeric keypad, it's so quick and so useful. So key five is a top view. Key zero on my numeric keypad is a top plan view. You'll notice up here it's changed to top plan. And here it says top. Key two is a front view. Key six is a view from the right. Key four is a view from the left. And key three is an isometric view. Now, when I do that and I change to those settings, if we just go back to our document preferences or our VectorX preferences, in 3D, when I change from a 2D plan, from a top plan view, and when I change to a 3D view, VectorWorks will automatically change it to shaded view instead of wireframe. And the law will automatically choose normal perspective because that's what I've chosen for my settings, which means that when I go from a top plan view to an isometric, straight away it's shaded, it's already perspective, and this makes it really quick for me to, to work in 3D. 
Now let's have a look at this. I've got my slab. Here it is, it's an unstyled slab. I'm going to edit this by clicking on the components. And I wanna change the components here. And I wanna change this component. At the moment it's five and seven eighths, so it's around about six inches thick, 150 millimeters, which I don't like. So I'm going to edit that. I can click on edit, or I can just type here and I can change this. And I really want this to be about 20 millimeters, which is about three quarters of an inch. So I could go 0 0.75, three quarters of an inch. There it is there, but it doesn't change some of the structure of this. So let's double click or click on the edit button and it'll open this up. So this is my ply floor. So I'm gonna call it my ply floor. What's its function? It's load bearing. And its class is, and now I need a new class for this. So the class for this is going to be floor, better spell it correctly. Floor dash flooring. If I want to edit the properties, at this stage I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, but I will be importing some classes and we'll make changes to them. I want to use the material for this. So here I'm going to use the material and I will look up ply if I can find plywood. Ply, here we are, we've got some sheathing ply. I'm going to choose one of these ones. And this material, the nice thing about these materials, not only does it cover the, the texture on this object, there's my texture automatically pulled in. It also, when I cut through it in section, it also gives me this, this hatch here. The thickness isn't really what I want, so I'm gonna change the thickness to something like 0.25. So when I cut a section, it'll actually have the snapping, or it'll actually have the, the line weight that I want. My snap points, I'm just gonna leave those alone at this stage, there's only one component, so it doesn't matter whether I master snap points or not. Okay, and okay. Now we should really have seen the texture on here. And so let's go back and have a look why we didn't. If we have a look at the render tab, you can see that it's rendering by object just here. And I want that to be by component. And I've already chosen the components. I've given it a material. And when you choose by component, it actually brings that material onto this component. If I had multiple components to this, if I had, for example, floor joists underneath, then I could also have the texture for that shown, shown separately from the texture of the flooring on top. And it's got a really nice texture, so straight away it's already there. I'm going to now go back to the shape because I think it would be a good idea to add another component to this. I'd like to add a new component, which is going to be my joists. Now at the beginning when I'm playing around with this or I'm modeling or getting my design underway, it's a good idea to give some of the thickness to these components so that you can actually see them as they build up. Later on, we might want to turn this, this off. So this again is load bearing. Its class is going to be a new class, which is going to be floor and joist. You might notice I keep using the word floor with a dash. This is going to group them all together. I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so we're going to use a material. We're not going to use plywood, we're going to use, is there a timber? Well, we got timber framing with insulation. How about that one? That will do, because we're going to put insulation between the joints. So we'll just use that one. And this is 0.25, we'll make these slightly thicker. And there will be a texture that looks like insulation. I'm not talking about the bounding of this. Uh, we haven't got any walls yet, so we're not connected. But I think I'll leave that for another day, those ones. Okay, thickness is about six inches, 150 millimeters. So let's make it six inches. In reality, by the time the timber dries, it's gonna be less than that. So it's gonna end up being about 140 millimeters. Uh, where I live, that the timber actually comes dried already 140 millimeters. There it is, five and a half inches. So this is what my slab is going to look like if I cut a section through it. The other thing I've got is the ability to choose which component is going to be the datum. At the moment, I've got the top of the ply floor as my datum, which means that if, if you realize that I've, this is set at zero, so the, just here we've got the Z offset at zero, that means that the top of my floor is zero. If I click on that and change it to the bottom, the offset here is still zero, but my timber floor is actually three quarters of an inch up in the air. Click on that again. I can also choose the floor joists. The bottom of the floor joist can be my datum. So this makes it really quick to set your datum correctly. 
I always think of the top of the floor being zero, so I'll just leave it that way. And so now I've got my floor. I think perhaps it's time to look at our wall. So I'm going to go back to my top plan view. That's key zero on the numeric keypad, just to quickly get there. And now where's my wall tool? So there's a set, a tool set here called my building shell tool set. So let's use that. There's a wall tool. Let's just find a wall that we want to use. And I want to use one which is imperial, but fixed height. And should we use one with, how about that one? That one with brick on it. We'll choose that one. Select that one. Now when I start drawing, you'll notice that it's the outside skin of the brick is going to be where my wall is located, which is okay, but that's not really what I want. What I'd like to do is I'd like to look at how this wall is constructed. I want to change some of the parts of this. Now I want this brick veneer. I'm going to edit this brick veneer. This wants to be plywood. Ply cladding. It's an outer finish. It's on the component exterior finish class. I could change that and put on a wall exterior finish, or I could just leave it and, and leave it like that. So the material is going to be, now we should be have ply again. So we should be able to use that one. So select that ply. The thickness is half an inch, 0.5. Now I can tell Vectorworks where this ply stops relative to my wall. Now I'm not using stories, so I can't use the relative to stories. That's a whole nother webinar. Um, but I want to follow the top peaks, but the bottom peaks, I actually want this to go below my plywood and below my joists and, then, and another two inches below that. So what I can do is I can say uh, minus 0.75, that'll actually make it three quarters of an inch below my top of my floor. In other words, uh, it'll make it in line with my plywood minus, what do we say, 140 millimeters or five and a half inches, 5.5 .5 inches again. So that's now taken the bottom of my plywood to the bottom of my joists. And I want to go two inches below that, 50 millimeters below that. So I've gone minus 20, minus 140 millimeters, minus 50 millimeters. So it's actually going to make my cladding go below the floor and just two inches below the bottom of my joist, protecting my joists from the weather. Cool. Now, if there are any questions that come up, please write the question as quick as you can. Um, stop me if you've got any questions about the way I'm doing stuff so that I can explain them. If I'm going too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, it's sometimes difficult for me to, to realize I'm going too fast. So what have we got? We've got the ply cladding. Let's click OK. So you can see my wall has changed straight away. Now, my airspace is actually only going to be 20 millimeters. That's, again, 0.75. So I'm going to click here. This is 0.75 of an inch, or three quarters of an inch, 20 millimeters. The sheathing is my rigid air barrier. That's only six millimeters, so that's quarter of an inch. And then my studs, five and a half inches. Actually, I'm going to change this to four and a half inches. Uh, three and a half, so it's 90 millimeters. 3.5 inches. And my gypsum is half an inch, 0.5. Now I've just left all the settings that came from Vectorworks here. So it's an air gap, it's other, it's load bearing, and this tick here that this is the core of the wall. And this is going to be really useful later on when we get into it, because this core of the wall is going to actually be able to, we're going to be able to draw the core of the wall. Now if I want to, uh, if I want to reuse this wall, I should really save this. And I can save it as that wall there, and it's no longer brick. It's, but it's, two by four and it's ply. Why do we save it? We save it so we can reuse it. If I okay that. So if we go to our resource manager and we have a look at our current file, there's the brick wall we imported, but here's the one that I want to use from now on. So it's really handy if you, if you save that style, it makes it much easier to go back to. Okay, so let's delete the walls that we've got. Let's go there, delete those walls. We're going to draw the walls again, this time using our plywood. Now, if I start here again, I'm going on the outside of my ply. If I click here, I can use the outside of my core. So I'll just draw a little bit, and now let's zoom in and have a look. Of course, the mouse wheel, the mouse, uh, the middle mouse wheel button on, on the mouse, we use that to zoom in and out. So now we've zoomed in, and you can see there's my 
internal wall lining, there's my studs, there's my sheathing, there's my air gap. And so now my studs line up with the outside of my slab, which is quite cool. So let's delete that. The quick way to draw this, use the rectangular mode. Click and click, and I've got my, got my walls done already. Go to a 3D view, remember that's key three, and you'll see that my sheathing actually goes down below my joists. So good so far, no questions. So it's going below my, right. So I'm just reading some notes that I wrote last night to make sure I do it, okay. So we've looked at the numeric keypad, key three, key one, key zero to go back to the top plan view. How about a door? There's my door object. What size do I want my door to be? We're going to make the door, there we are, it's my settings. So what's the width of my door? Three feet, two foot six. I want a 110 millimeter door. What height? Six foot eight's fine. The insertion relative to the center of the jam, which is great. And I want to look at this in detail. Uh, so we've got this type of door, the top shape, we can be round, segmented and so on, square. I'm not gonna include a transom. Transom would actually put a skylight or sorry, a fan light above it. I don't want to include one of those. And the configuration is swing. It can be a barn door. It can just be an opening, which just punches a hole in the wall. Case opening allows you to put a, a jam in it and pocket sticks into the wall. This is a simple or a simple swing door. 2D visualization, we can control the classes for all these objects if we want. We can do it by line style, by class, or I'm just going to leave it by object. There's a lot of power in this. Uh, 3D visualization, we want to show the exterior marker. And uh, what do I really want to do? Jam. We can use the wall depth to start with. And later I'm going to change this. this I'm going to change this so it, it comes back to a specific size. We want the leaf to be glass. So it's a glazed door. We can choose the top rail width is going to be three inches, three inches, and 12 inches for the bottom. So it should have a, a quite high rail there. We can save this. We can save this as a style and then reuse this again and again. Could be quite useful. So that's enough for today. Let's go OK and we'll put this door in. So there it is. There's my door. Notice the wall highlights in red. There it is, so it's highlighted in red. Click, which way do we want the door to swing? It swings out, goes that direction. And there we are. What else do we want to know? Well, there's some things that are quite important. So for this particular design, and this is based on a design I've done previously, and we had a specific distance from this, the edge of this cladding here, from the edge of this stud wall, to the start of my door actually had to be 635 millimeters to line up with my board and batten. So it's a specific distance. If I click over here with the set position button, I can click at this corner here. I can click at the start of my door and then I can tell Vectorworks. Now the first click was my reference point. Great. I need that to be 635 millimeters and it'll relocate my door. Now there are other ways to do it. So it's automatic. I just want to show you that you can relocate them afterwards. So that's a door. Doors closed in 3D. If you want to open in 3D, you can tick to open in 3D. The only danger with opening the doors in 3D is that when you do an elevation, the doors will all be hanging out the elevation of the building. Window, how about a window? So I want a window, I'm going to put a window in here. Before I put in a window, let's just do our settings for this. And the settings are similar to the door. They're not exactly the same, but they are similar. So we can have a, a general size. It can be a casement, an opening, a cased opening, a custom, a picture window slider. I'm going to choose custom. Uh, the width of my window, now I can't remember what this is in, in Imperial, uh, but I remember it was 1735 millimeters. And that again lines up with my board and batten. I know these are weird dimensions, but it just lined up with my, my battens. The height of my window, four feet, the elevation of the wall, six foot eight. So the head of my window, because I'm using the head, the head of my window lines up with the head of my door, makes it real easy. You can use the sill of the window, but I don't like it because for this case, I'd have to do some mental arithmetic and I'm not very keen on that. So head of the window, 
head of the window for the door. I know they line up, it makes it much easier. Custom sash. So in this custom sash, I'm gonna create two columns. One of these is going to be an awning hung. So in other words, hinged at the top, and the other one's gonna be fixed. So that gives me two panes. One's gonna be fixed, one's not. So let's go down to 2D visualization. You can see it's similar to the door. 3D visualization, similar to the door, we wanna see the exterior marker. We can put tags on windows. I'm not going to worry about this one at the moment. I didn't do the door jam, so I should really have done the door jam. I wanna make it an inch, one inch, which where I come from would be 19 millimeters for the jam liner and six millimeters for the gap. And I don't use the shim gap here, I just put it into the jam itself so that when I do a window elevation, I can dimension it and it's the rough opening of the window as well. Okay, so we've got the shim gap, sill, I'm not gonna put a sill, I'm not gonna put any trim, I'm not gonna worry about the lintel, and we can add loads of data to this stuff. So quite often one of the things I do here is I use this user field one to insert the lintel size, and then I can have a tag pick up the lintel sizes on my plans. But it's a quick start, so we're not gonna do that. So how do we put this window in? We come to a wall, we click, and we place it. So again, I'm not gonna worry about placing it accurately to start with, but I'll just show you that you can come back up to here, set the position. We wanna click from that corner to here, and it's 600 and, is it 635 millimeters? And so that window is accurately placed. I know now when I put my board and battens on, it'll actually line up with my board and battens. Go back to my window. I'm gonna go back to my settings this time. Now you can do the settings afterwards, so let's do that. Let's put the window in first. Then we can go back to our settings and we can change it and we'll make it a awning hung, not horizontal slider, where's it gone? Awning, awning hung and its width is only two feet. 24 inches, 600 millimeters, and three feet high, so 36 inches high, and okay. So I've got that little window, and I need to do that same setting again, which is actually this tool here, which is the move by points tool. So from that corner to there, whatever that was. There we are. So now when I look at my drawing, you can see if I look at this in an elevational type view, you can see the head of my windows line up and they should also line up the head of the door. So everything is lining up beautifully. So that's my windows. Now I'm just gonna have a look at my windows. Now I've decided to change my mind about these windows. I've decided that the, if I come down here, I wanna look at the jam size. So there's my jam there. I've decided I want this jam to be about that's what's the jam depth at the moment it's four and a half inches let's make it three and a half inches and you can see there it is my jam is in the center of my wall so what i'd like to do is i'd like to have it where's it gone up the top here so i'm going to insert on the wall center line but i can also use the center line of my core component and you'll notice that that's actually moved my jam back so it lines up with the core of my wall. We didn't used to have this, this neat feature. I really like that because we can zoom, it makes it really quick. So let's do this one again. So we'll select that. We'll go up to here. It's the wall center line. Now it's the core component center line. And then I can scroll down here to find the jam. I can make the jam three and a half. And there it is, lines up perfectly. Now I can take these core components, I can, or these cladding components, I can wrap these components into my jam. And this is a quick start, so I'm not gonna do that. If we do the same with the door, the door is also on the core center line and the jam is again going to be 3.5. And there it is, so it lines up. So that's kind of cool. So we've done the wall, uh, we've done the 3D view, we've done the door, we've done the window. So there are no questions so far. Oh, here's a, there is a question. 
Is there an easy way to put the door or window in the middle of a wall? Actually, James, there is a real easy way to do it. If I go back to my window, I'll just go back to my window object, we've got here the ability to use the align left mode, the align center mode, uh, align right, or the object insertion. But at the moment, it's on the center line of my wall. So let's uh, place that, and we're going to come down here, and we're going to place that. And you might notice as I get close, there's a little gray mark just there, and it says midpoint. And you can be the midpoint of the outside, the midpoint of the inside, and then you click and place it. The, the other thing I didn't cover, James, was that I could actually use this mode here, the object insertion mode, using the left. Let's just go back to that. Let's use the left side, object insertion mode. So I could click on my studs there. I could click on that wall, click along the wall and then type in 635 millimeters. That would have placed it really quick, straight off. I wouldn't have had to go back and move it. But um, I just want to show you, you could move it. I've done the window, now it's time to do the roof. We've got our slab, we've also got walls. We need to select all of our walls and the easy way to select the walls is to use this select similar tool. The Select Similar tool I've already got set up here to use Class, Object, or Object. So what have I done? I've actually gone here to my Select Similar tool Preferences. And if I choose each of these, you'll see that I've ticked certain things. Class and Object, Object Only. Uh, let's do another one, which would be uh, Wiz Wall. Let's choose, uh, we'll save this one, we'll call it Wall Style. And you might just change that and just say, call that style. And it should replace the one. Make sure I spell it right. Yep, spell it right. Cool. Now that means that if I choose wall style and I click on a wall, every wall of the same style will be selected. Of course, I've got the, it'll be the same effect if I use class and object because they're all in the same class. Wall exterior. How do I know it's wall exterior? If I select a wall, you can see it here, it says wall exterior. Now I don't think I've created classes for my slab and I'm gonna to have to go back and create an overall class for my slab and some other things as well. But let's get, let's start by selecting all of our walls, select some of the tools, select our walls, AEC on the menu bar, and we're gonna create our roof. Do we want a double edge to it? Do we want a horizontal part? Do we want a vertical or do we want it square? I tend to use vertical because normally I put a gutter on the edge and so I need to have a fascia. The thickness, we're going to change the thickness because what we really want to do is to create some components to this. So we're going to look at our roof preferences. So let's start here. So this top part is going to be my cladding. What function is it? It's an outer finish. And we're going to call this a new class. I don't think I've got any classes for this, so let's create a new class, roof dash. I'm going to create an overall one called roof main to start with, because I'm going to assign this to the roof main. And then I'm going to create a new class for this cladding. So it's roof dash, and I'm going to call it cladding. But I could use, let's choose that. Now I could use here one that's already created called component exterior finish. Now, if I use that one, then when I turn off the exterior finish of this component, it will also turn off the exterior finish of my walls. And the question is, if you want them both to turn off at the same time, then use that one. But if you don't, if you want to have separate control, then use something like this roof cladding. What's my material? And my material is a corrugated roof. Corrugated metal. Uh, yep, let's choose that one. What's its thickness? Uh, three quarters of an inch, 20 millimeters is what it really is. And it's bounded by the roof edge, which means it goes out to the roof. And I'm going to leave those parts. Okay, now what do I need to support that? I need some purlins. So I'm gonna create a new component here. Purlins, their function is load bearing. Their class is going to be Roof-Purlins. 
and I'm going to edit the properties after creation. So this time, I'm actually going to control the graphic style of these. I want these to be solid. I want them to be a black line. But you could easily change these to a no fill. Now, the, the trouble with no fill is it will affect your three-dimensional rendering. So I tend to make them solid. What color do I want them to be? Now, my color, every time I do uh, go to meeting, my color palette turns up on the other screen. So you won't see this when I do it. Uh, let's just click here. I'm going to choose a... a standard red color i just had to move something out of the way uh, classic colors let's choose red and i want that to be 0.18 so it shows up so i won't change the other ones now the, the beauty of using classes to control the graphic style is when i come to create my drawings my viewports i can then adjust the graphic style of these objects in the viewport so you could just leave these all in blank if you wanted And you could not worry about this line weight, and then you could adjust it when you get to creating the drawings. But the important thing is the user creation. You've got to tick this. Okay, to that, we're going to have the material. This is going to be timber. Now, we've used timber already, so we should be able to come back here and use timber. This is timber with uh, framing. But we could also try and find one which is timber without framing. Timber, not timber siding, just timber. How about that one there? We'll choose that one. And it has all these things, so we can change that to 0.18. The thickness of this is uh, two inches. It's actually 45 millimeters, 50 or two inches. And it's bounded at the roof edge, and I'm not gonna worry about that. It is, after all, just a quick start to get you guys started. So I've got now my cladding, I've got my purlins. What do I need next? I need some rafters. Rafters, what's their function? Again, they're load bearing. Their class is roof rafters. And the reason I'm using classes, separate classes for these is so that I can change them later on in my viewports. Uh, so no, so solid fill white, solid fill black, 0.18 again. Uh, if we make that magenta, you'll be able to see it more clearly. 0.25 thickness for that. Uh, that's all I'm going to do for those. So it's using the material, using the same timber material as before. That is without the insulation. If you want to put the, the one with insulation, we can choose the one with the insulation, that one there, and it'll put the insulation in for us. Okay, thickness. So these are about six inches, 5.5 inches, 140 millimeters, and rafters 0.25. I think I want what I wanted. Now we can click here, make all attributes by class, and all of those attributes will be controlled by the class. Now the datum. Do we want to be controlling the height of the roof based on the on the cladding, on the purlins, or on the rafters? And this is the underside of the rafter or the top of the rafter. I'm gonna choose the underside of my rafter. Now, if I wanted to, I could put ceiling in as well, and I can then stop the ceiling against the walls, which is really cool. But I think, um, are we getting on for time, Barbara? Yeah, it would be better not dilly-dally too much. So, okay, to that, we've got the height here. What's our roof pitch? 22.5 degrees. The bearing inset, five and a half inches. The bearing height is going to be eight feet. Oh, well, I'd be careful to write eight feet. Uh, Eve overhang, 24 inches or two feet. And it's going to go on the roof main class. Now, this roof that I've been creating, these roof preferences, is unstyled. If I wanted to reuse these on another project, let's save that and we'll call it, um, what would that be? It would be two by six with corrugated iron. Corrugated two by six. Okay, and then don't forget how many times I've forgotten that. If you don't retain the original objects, of course, you can lose all your walls. And there's our roof. They're looking 3D. There we are. Yeah, it doesn't look quite what like we wanted. Well, let's just go back to that view. What's wrong with my rendering? It's by object, let's choose by component. 
and now you'll see that I've got the right texture on each of my components. I want this to be a gable roof, so I can click here and make that a gable. I can click here and make it a gable. I don't know if it's popular overseas, but where I live, it's really popular to have a mono pitch roof, a roof that only goes in one direction. So I'm going to make that a gable as well. And you can see I've got a mono pitch roof. And the angle, probably about eight degrees where I live. We don't have to worry about snow. So what's the problem now? Well, it would be really nice if my roof could cut my walls off. Now, I haven't yet put my roof on a separate layer. I should do. Um, but I, it appears I didn't bother to check what I was doing. You can see here everything I've created so far is on my roof. So I'm going to have to fix that. Um, but what I'm going to do next is I'm going to select all my walls. So let's fix it now. So select all your walls. So what have we got object in class. And we should be able to put all of those onto my walls layer. Yeah, you can see that we've gone see-through. Select my slab. Let's put that onto my walls layer as well. And now we're going to change our layer options to show snap others. Now you can't tell the difference between what we had before. If you've been using Vectorworks for quite a while and you're really handy with it, use show snap modify others because it allows you to select uh, stuff on other layers. So let's select our walls. Now we're going to fix everything. AEC. Fit walls to objects. Choosing, we have to choose things on the roof layer. And now we've got the walls following the roof, which is quite cool. So what's left? I think we haven't got any foundations. So we're going to go back to our walls layer. Just hide our roof. Makes it really easy to hide. That's my floor slab. So I'm going to right click and send that to the back. I need to hide some things. So this is on the wall exterior. If we have a look at our classes, we've got a class called wall exterior. I can hide that. What's this? This is my slab. I'm going to create a new class for this if I need to. So I should have a class called floor, flooring and joists. So let's right click here. We'll duplicate this one. Duplicate. Flooring to, I'm going to call this floor main. And then I can right click on floor main and I can assign it to that selection. When I turn that class off, all my flooring disappears. Great. Let's bring it back though. We need it. So here's my floor. It's my slab. And what do I need to do next? I need to create some floor structure. So AEC. Framing, there it is there, and we're going to create joists using slab component. Now you notice that Vectorworks has now recognized my different slab components, so I'm going to use my joists. It's automatically going to set those my joists to the correct elevation. My center to center spacing is two in, uh, 24 inches. I think I can get away with maybe 18 inches, 450 millimeters. What class do we want to use? Floor, and we've got one called joist. There's my floor joist. What about my joist properties? Their width is 45 millimeters, uh, just under an inch. The height, I made them 140, which is five and a half inches. And it picks this information up from that component already. Display is width. Uh, width, I think, is what I want. I can change these later on. And OK, I'm not going to show the label. I'm going to draw the perimeter joists. These are also going to be on the floor. Where it go? Perimeter joists. Yep, they're OK. Uh, where they go? Here, class. I accidentally chose to mention floor joist. There we are. Uh, what's my framing member? So we're going to choose here. These are going to be class, class. And the thickness is going to be the class as well. And I'd also do that up here under the joist attributes here. So let's make them all by class, class style, class, and class. Okay. That joint, 
I think that's correct. If, there's, if I get anything wrong, I can always fix it later. Where do I want to start? Click here, come down here, click, and Vectorworks actually creates a little joist takeoff over here, and there it is. Now, if you don't like that, you can go back and redo it. Let's just redo it, and let's delete all of those. Uh, set those objects, let's just select those objects, and we'll delete those, and we'll do it again. So now I'm going to do it again, only this time I'm going to use my center line. So let's create joists again, joist properties. We're going to use center line here. We're going to make them width or solid. I like them solid, I think. Oh, oh, what did I just see? Not wood truss, that's a solid beam is what I want. Okay. And these ones here, just check these ones as well. That's solid, not a wood truss. That's a solid beam again. Okay, okay. And then I'm going to start in the midpoint this time. And there they are. Now this is what it looks like with solid beam and the, the look is solid. If I choose width, that's how I like to show them as the width. And because they're on a class called floor joist, I can change that class and change the graphic style, which is quite handy. What else do I need? Let's go back to here. We're going to go to AC again. I better select my floor. This is my slab, AC. This time we're going to use flooring, framing. We're going to create my joists again. This time I'm going to create uh, my joists are there. I use the slab component joists, but I actually need to change this because it, I need to bring them down a bit. Uh, I want to use that. I need a new class or dash para para. Okay, and this is going to be use a creation again. Point three five point two five. We can make them dashed. Okay. Now this time, no perimeter joists. The center to center spacing is going to be more like four feet, 1200 millimeters. Let's go 48 inches. Floor bearer, the joist properties, just check those again. The, the width is going to be a bit wider than that. I need them to be 90 millimeters wide or three and a half inches. And the height is going to be about four and a half inches high, four and a half. And they're going to be displayed as width and OK, and OK again. And I want them to be uh, uh, just set up, set from, or a little bit up from there. So I want the one to start there. And you can see it only created two. This one, I'm going to mirror. So using my mirror tool, mirror about the midpoint there. And then those three, right click, align and distribute, and distribute vertically. So I end up with my bear in the middle. But it's actually at the wrong elevation. When you see it, it'd be at the, at the wrong elevation. So what I need to do is to change the elevation of this. I'm going to change this to, now if we have a look, the vertical reference is the top. Now I should have some joists here that I can use as a guide. I'm going to move those down. So let's just move those down to minus eight inches, minus eight. Let's see where they go. So they're there. Now let's check my other joists. These ones here. If I have to go back to a top plane view, do I have that one? So those are all my framing member objects there. Object in class. Now it should have just been those joists there. So they should be uh, the top of those. Where's the top? Our vertical reference is the top. So those should have, they should have ended up at minus 20 millimeters or minus three quarters of an inch. There they are there. Now I do have a problem in that I've created this component on the same class as my joists. If I go back to my slab and I edit my slab so I can edit my components, I can actually remove that one completely. There they are there. And let's select all my joists. I must have done something silly to the joists. Let's go back to those. So that's the height. What have we got? 
we've got all those objects, the width, the height, I've changed the height, that should be 140 millimeters, whatever that is. And these ones here should be at a height of <clears throat> minus 20 millimeters, minus 140 millimeters. I'm sorry, I can't do this in Imperial Maths, but there we have those on their right class. So it's on floor bearer, these should be on floor joist, and now I can turn them on and off when I want. So let's start turning everything back on. Let's turn on all of my layers. So there's my layers. Let's turn on all my classes. And there's my project. The one thing I do like, I, I really like this one here, the clip queue. I think this is so cool. So let's just undo the clip queue. What I'd like to do is show you the, the tricks that I use with a clip queue, uh, that you select an object like the wall, activate the clip cube, and the clip cube just goes around that wall. And then we can see the, um, we can see the cut through the building. There's my clip cube. I can stretch it that way. I can stretch it top, bottom, and it makes it really cool for, for looking at your model. If you need to rotate the clip cube, you can use these little blue handles. I quite often draw non-orthogonally, and then you can just rotate the view or rotate your clip cube to suit. So I think, Barbara, that's covered just about everything I wanted. I'm just gonna go back to this drawing here. So the next thing that we would do would be to create the cover sheet, the foundation plan using the classes that we created, the floor plan, creating sections through it, showing the elevations, the section through the building and so on. And I think that would be a separate webinar, Barbara. I don't think we've got time yes. to do that today. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, stay tuned. We'll let you know when the second webinar will be. Don't miss it. So Thank just in you case so you much, didn't Tony. know, we've got yeah. my knowledge base, my visual knowledge base, where I've collected all my movies together. It's really easy to search. And if you want to go back over this movie again, don't forget that I've got a YouTube channel. That was the one we went through, the quick start. And if you want to follow up with that, there was the one here. This is what we'll do for the next one. I think, Barbara, the quick start to creating drawings. Yep. Yep. Thank Thanks you so much, Jonathan. Yeah, I will take the screen back again just to show you where you can find Vectorwork, Vectorworks Architect on our website. And remember, the Novage is the really easiest way to buy design software online. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Have a great rest of the day and see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.